thanks for inviting me to talk about nesting and breeding biology of birds. Uh, my name is Sahas Barve, and uh, I'm a Peter Buck postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. And uh, so I'm going to try and uh, make two, like try to explain 200 million years of evolution in 20 minutes, uh, which is going to be very challenging, but uh, let's try and get, get through as much as we can. Uh, the photo in the uh, photo on the main slide uh, may seem to some people like the uh, like the nests of viewer birds, but uh, such bag nests or such woven nests have also evolved multiple times independently across birds, and these are actually nests of Montezuma oropendolas, which are uh, a completely different family of birds. They're called icteridae. Uh, if you have seen photos of red-winged blackbirds uh, from North America, they are from this family. And they are a beautiful colonial nesting bird, really, really cool vocalizations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, when we... Uh, I'm not going to get into a lot of the pre-nesting behavior uh, because that's really, really difficult to cram into 20 minutes because there's so much different behavior. But, but let's, let's try and uh, touch on it as much as possible. Um, and if you're thinking about the nesting biology of birds, uh, it's important to start uh, thinking from whether uh, they build a nest or not, right? So uh, what is their mode of breeding? And so um, most of the most birds uh, do build some kind of nest. Uh, it might be a scrape in the ground, or it might be a really intricately woven nest, like the uh, oropendolas that I just uh, showed you. Uh, but a um, huge majority of birds, uh, like this blue headed tanager, uh, build cup nests. And um, but there are lots and lots of birds that do not build a nest at all. They just lay eggs in the nests of other birds. And that's really important to remember also. Brood parasitism, as it is called, uh, where uh, females lay their eggs in other birds, uh, is, common, is a common strategy in many, many different families of birds, not only just uh, cuckoos, as the photo here suggests. Even within cuckoos, there are uh, intraspecies parasites, which means that Females will dump, will lay their eggs in the nests of other nest builds, oh. like other individuals that have their own nests, but also interspecies parasites where, uh, like cuckoos, uh, this cuckoo especially is a common cuckoo that's been fed by uh, like a European reed warbler. And uh, so there are interspecies parasites also. So when you, when you don't build a nest, you can either dump your eggs in uh, someone from your own species or someone from another species. All right. Uh, so then the next question is, what kind of nests do you, uh, do you build? So bird nests vary tremendously. Uh, there are about 11,000 species of birds now after the last taxonomic uh, change. So, so as you might imagine, uh, for a, a group that's so diverse, uh, that there is a huge diversity in nest types also. Um, and let me see. Okay. So uh, different kind of nests for birds include mounds, like this brush turkey from Australia. It's, it's a megapode. Uh, uh, just like Nicobar megapode, uh, this, and this bird is also builds large mounds where uh, they nest. But so some birds make mounds above ground. Some make some birds actually nest in burrows. And uh, again, as throughout the uh, throughout the presentation, I will try to include uh, examples for each uh, kind of behavior. And you will see that many different, completely unrelated to each other, uh, families have independently evolved the same behavior again and again because of natural selection. And we can talk about that in your questions at the end. But um, under so many birds have underground nests, so a lot of uh, petrels, storm petrels, uh, actually lay, make burrows. Penguins make burrows. Uh, burrowing owls make burrows. A lot of larks uh, make sort of burrows or actual true burrows. Wheat ears make burrows. Uh, Hume's groundpecker, which is another cool bird that you see in Ladakh, uh, nests in burrows, and so. Uh, 
uh, a lot of birds make burrow nests. Uh, many, many uh, birds are, I don't, I don't know what the numbers are, but a big majority of the birds make uh, nests in some kind of uh, hole. Uh, sorry, some kind of vegetation. So it could be uh, tree holes or it could be open nests. It could be hanging nests. Any kind of uh, nest that is in some vegetation. So on ground, below ground, in the trees. And of course, there are uh, nests on water. So uh, dippers, uh, grebes, and jacanas, uh, a bunch of different birds, again. Uh, make water nests and there are there are some birds that make floating nests there are some birds that make nests in the reeds um, but they're all above water okay so that's what kind of nests uh, birds have so the next question is how many parents so uh, we might think that uh, every nest has two parents but that's not always the case actually uh, parental care uh, or how much who provisions the chicks uh, with food and protection uh, and body warmth com also completely varies across the birds so uh, some birds have zero parents so megapodes uh, many kiwis uh, sorry i could i guess all species of kiwis and uh, many many species of cuckoos actually have zero direct parents. So the bird that lays the egg or, or her mate do not have any, any role to play in the parental like upbringing of the chick. So I don't know if you guys know, but all megapodes and kiwis, they are completely uh, fully functional little chicks when they come out. And megapod chicks hatch out and uh, actually dig themselves out of the uh, mound nest and just walk away. And uh, the parents never see them again. A uh, really cool part about megapod chicks is that they're fully flighted also. They can fly as soon as they come out. Uh, as you can see in this photo, which is uh, off of, of a brush turkey, I want to say chick. And you can see how well developed uh the wing feathers are already when it's freshly hatched out of the nest so uh if you've seen nicobar megapod photos uh nicobar megapod babies just dig themselves out of those mounds and walk away and and feed themselves uh from day one so do kiwi chicks and obviously uh brood parasitic cuckoos don't parent their uh young either because someone else is doing it uh, many birds also have what is called uniparental care and uniparental care is where uh, only one of the two sexes uh, takes care of the chicks. And again, uniparental care is uh, distributed across many, many different families. So a lot of charade reforms, a lot of uh, wearers actually have uniparental care, whether only the father uh, or only the mother feeds the young there are a lot of uh, jacanas, all jacanas around the world are uniparental care because they have uh, male only uh, parental care. But there are tons and tons of birds that have also female only parental care. And these uh, range from birds of paradise that all we, we all know. You must have seen their amazing displays uh, on Nat Geo or Discovery. Uh, hopefully, one, hopefully you'll see some... Uh, in real life in your lifetime also uh, but all birds of paradise are except except one i think uh have have no parental care in males so the males are just beautiful bags of sperm that display all display all day all well not all day but all uh, year round and females visit those legs and uh, and mate with them and that's the that's the end uh, the female builds the nest, lays the eggs, raises the chicks, feeds the chicks, everything on their own. So there's uh, uniparental care. In... Uh -huh. Go ahead, yeah. Prana. So do ostriches, emus, and cassowaries, and that uh, rhea, those big birds also come under the category of megapods. And as far as I know, in those birds, the parental care is uh, exhibited by male parent. That means the uh, um, father. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's a great question. So uh no uh, megapods is a different family of birds uh ostriches rias uh cassowaries and 
uh, tenemus and kiwis are all part of a group called ratites uh, that are completely different, uh, very, very distinctly related uh, group to megapods. And so in, in ratites, uh, there is again very, a lot of variation in, uh, in parental care, in cassowaries, especially uh, males are the primary caregivers, but in ostriches, actually, it's 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 not always that the female uh, the male has a big role, definitely, but females also participate. The and I'll come to why that is important or why that is different uh, in a moment. But megapods and ratites are very different. To answer your question, in short. Does that work? Can you hear me, Prana? Yeah, okay, sure. Okay, I'll continue. Uh, so we've done how many parents and some birds have zero parents, some birds have one, uh, one parent, uh, but uh, again, a large majority uh, of birds have two parents, uh, like these bald eagles. And uh, there, is, there is a social mother and a social father. And they, uh, there is, again, when we say two parents, uh, this is because we are talking about birds, although it obviously <laughs> relates to all animals, including humans. Um, there is scientists always call them social mothers and social fathers, and they might not be the same as biological mother and biological father. Uh, but in most birds, two parents uh, take care uh, and feed and provide protection to the young. But in many, many birds, about nine percent of all birds so that's about uh, between 1000 and 1200 species of birds around the world uh, chicks have more than two parents and that those are uh, called cooperatively breeding birds and cooperatively breeding birds also are found in many different families these uh, are actually eider ducks from uh, so eiders are found all around uh, the north pole or high latitudes of of uh, the northern hemisphere uh, throughout europe russia and north america and uh, where females actually band together to raise chicks together so females are cooperatively bringing up each other's chicks but jungle babblers are cooperatively nesting uh, bee, uh, gr small green bee eaters are cooperatively breeding and many many other birds around uh, the world have some form of cooperative breeding where more than one, uh, more than two parents take care of the chicks. I see that there's a chat. Oh, there we go. I just got that. Uh, two megapods and kiwis uh, need to learn hunting and similar behaviors from parents. Uh, well, it's all instinctive. So they they get all their instincts from uh, from the get go. They don't. I don't think there is any uh teaching especially definitely not in megapods i don't know about kiwis actually uh there may be they might hang around in the same territory as the parent but i don't know if there's actual teaching uh okay so so then we got yeah we got from how many parents from zero to many is the answer across all birds let then let's look at how many eggs are laid right so all birds uh, unlike mammals uh, where some mammals lay eggs and some mammals bear live young all birds lay eggs and uh, they the the primary adaptation for laying eggs is that i think um, is considered to be that the development of the embryo can happen outside the female's body and uh, because most birds are flighted uh, or because the females can't find it difficult to walk around with a bunch of eggs uh, or escape predation with a bunch of eggs that's why it may have evolved we don't know what the actual answer is but it, you can imagine that a bird that uh, flies probably needs uh, can't have large embryos within them Right, so um, the biggest egg for body mass is uh, laid by kiwis, and you should you should look up photos of uh, there are whole body X-rays of kiwis, size of the egg to her body. After the kiwi is completely when it's born, but uh, again.
again, so how many eggs? Well, again, the answer is one to many. So many birds lay only one egg. Uh, and this includes not only big birds like penguins and albatross, but a bunch of tropical birds uh, have an average of one to two eggs only per clutch. Okay, they may lay many clutches. Um, and the, the other extreme is many. And I think uh, uh, several passerines have uh, large clutch sizes. Uh, many birds are also what are called cereal layers. So uh, uh, cereal laying is something that chickens do, right? Because uh, when, uh, when we farm chickens for eggs, they lay one egg every day. Uh, and if you take out eggs from some birds' nests, they they can do what is called cereal laying. And uh, there's some research with, uh, there's one paper on uh, this American woodpecker species called the uh, Northern Flicker. Uh, Northern Flickers have the record for the longest single cereal laying bout. And so this researcher was going in and taking out what the egg that the female was laying every day. And the female laid 79 eggs in a row. So she was laying for almost whatever, two and a half months, an egg every day. And eggs are a really, really difficult thing to produce for the female uh, because they take a lot of energy to, and she, and she has to eat a lot of uh, calcium to produce eggs. So it's really incredible that some birds have the capacity to just keep laying all day, uh, even when in there in the wild. With chickens, it's, it's a little less surprising because we give them a lot of nutrition and all the food they get catered towards making sure that they have enough nutrients to produce eggs. But in the wild, it's really important. Uh, it, there has been some other research in uh, North America that suggests that uh, a lot of birds eat empty snail shells in uh, during the breeding season. And so they'll go and find empty snail shells to eat because they are full of calcium and uh, their body uses that calcium too. Uh, to produce eggs so the how many eggs do birds lay it totally varies from one to many okay uh, and i've written tempered birds here and uh, that i'll come to that point uh, point in a second so uh, when i say temperate it i was talking about uh, tr tropical and temperate so all like broadly classifying all all regions of the earth uh, between zero and 23 degree 23.5 degrees north and south of the equator are considered tropics and everything above that are called temperates in both hemispheres um, and there is a very especially in the northern hemisphere there's a very strong latitudinal gradient in clutch size in how many eggs are laid by birds and so if you look, especially within passerines, I think it's across all birds. I'm pretty sure it's across all birds, but it's especially strong within passerine birds. Passerine birds are about, uh, make up about, or more than half of all birds uh, in the world are passiformes or pass, passerine birds, birds that, um, perching birds, they're also called perching birds or singing birds or song birds. Uh, and there is a very strong latitudinal gradient where Tropical passerines or tropical birds in on average lay smaller clutch sizes than temperate birds. So uh, this is true within and across species. So if you have one species that lives at in both the tropics and the temperate areas, they, they lay larger clutch sizes or large more number of eggs per breeding attempt uh, in temperate areas than tropical areas. Does that Make sense? Give me a hand, give me a thumbs up if that makes sense. I do have one okay. question. Great. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is there any theory as to why this happens? Why, as we move up in latitude, the clutch size increases? Mm -hmm. that is, that's a good question. So, uh -huh. go ahead, Amrita. No, I I just said it's the same question that I wanted to ask. Okay, great. Uh, so this is a, a, I'll get to this question at the end, maybe, because it has a slightly long answer. And I want to make sure that I uh, go through the meat of the uh, presentation. Okay, but I'll, I'll remember that it's a really good, interesting question. Um, 
So not only is there a latitudinal gradient in clutch size, there is a uh, clutch size is actually uh, affected by a bunch of different factors. Uh, and cavity nesters also always have larger clutch sizes than uh, than open nesting birds. Um, and the the most prevalent hypothesis for that is that open nesting birds uh, often lose their uh, entire clutch to predators, and so they hedge their bets. Right, so. Uh, they don't want to lay all the eggs that they can produce in one go. And so they often uh, will have many small broods rather than one large brood. And so if you look at species within the same family uh, that have both cavity nesters and open cup nesters, the open cup nesters have smaller clutch sizes than the cavity nesters. Okay, so uh, then let's talk about once the eggs hatch and the babies come out. So all, many, many birds have a really, really cool, uh, really hard part of their beak uh, called, a, called an egg tooth that helps them break the egg and uh, eggshell uh, when they emerge. And uh, birds emerge uh, after an incubation period. So I didn't talk actually about incubation periods, but Incubation periods um, vary widely. Uh, uh, Rahul, can you make sure that we to extend the time for the, or should I wrap up in ten minutes? Oh, no, we can continue after ten minutes. So we'll okay. We'll make another session. Yeah, okay. we'll make sure. another. Session. Okay, sounds good. So. Uh, most of the incubation in a lot of passerine birds is actually done by females only, but that's again, not true uh, always. Uh, one thing that is important to remember is that it's very, very, in many birds, uh, the incubation period does not start until all eggs are laid. So all, most birds in the world lay only one egg a day. And so if a female is going to lay seven eggs, then uh, she will lay one egg a day and keep the temp keep the eggs at a temperature where they where the embryos don't die, but at this at a temperature where the embryos do not start to develop. Uh, and this is because uh, there is uh, it's very so the the chicks that hatch out first, if they hatch out uh, one or a few days earlier than the other chicks, they have a significantly they have like a significant advantage because they grow much fast or grow bigger faster than the other chicks um, and many birds don't want that to happen so uh, they don't start incubation until all the eggs are laid uh, and once once the clutch size is complete then clutch is complete then the female starts incubating them regularly they turn the eggs uh, and uh, some they make sure that the eggs that are on the periphery get rolled into the center to get maximum heat and there's really cool thermal radiation uh, of incubation also but let's say they've all done all that and now the eggs are hatching uh, the length of the nestling phase uh, is typically if you look at all passerines which is uh, 5,000 birds I think the average is about 14 days about two weeks after uh, after the chicks hatch out. But again, that varies really, really widely by whether the birds are precocial or ultracial. Uh, so the word precocial means that they are completely independent at birth, uh, that they can feed themselves at birth uh, and that they can run around. So uh, duck chicks, ostrich chicks, again, obviously megabirds uh, are precocial. And ultracial uh, birds are birds that are born, is often hatch out naked uh, with no feathers, not being able to maintain their own body temperature, requiring food and warmth and protection by uh, by their parents. So the nestling stage is obviously longer in altricial uh, chicks. In, uh, in precocial birds with precocial chicks, they can just walk away from the nest. Right? There is no, almost no nestling stage. Uh, again, whether the bird is open, open nesting or cavity nesting, Cavity nesting birds have much longer uh, 
nestling stages than open nesting birds. For example, um, like I said, the nestling stage for a lot of passerines is between 14 and 21 days, but several cavity nesting passerines actually have nestling phases, phases of even 25 or 30 days. So it totally, totally depends on the bird. Uh, size of the bird. So the bigger the bird, the longer it takes to get to that size. And so nestlings of big, big birds uh, stay in the nest for much longer. So stork babies and eaglet babies uh, live in the nest for much longer than a sparrow chick. Okay. Um, and the another thing is predation pressure, right? So in areas with high predation pressure. Uh, many species have evolved to jump out of the nest really early. So uh, many birds that live in high predation density areas, uh, even populations of uh, species within the general, within the larger species, uh, some birds may hop out of the nest at 10 days, even before they can fly, uh, just so that they can get away from the nest, which where the parents have to keep coming back and may predators are really smart and they keep watching the bird going back and forth with food in its mouth and then they realize that there's chicks there so they go and eat the chicks. Uh, a really good example is uh, ashy crowned and black crowned uh, sparrow larks in India. Uh, those ground nesting birds, a lot of ground nesting birds like larks often fledge the, the term of leaving the nestling. The leaving the nest is called fledging. Often fledge uh, before they can fly. So they'll fledge but they'll go and sit under a bush or something uh, and not in the nest. And thirdly, environmental constraints. And that's why uh, I have that photo. The lower photo uh, of a bird that looks like a sparrow is actually uh, an old world sparrow called a salt marsh sparrow. And salt marsh sparrows have the most amazing uh, breeding biology because they, f they are female only parental care, first of all, and they nest in uh, these salt marshes where the grass, so they nest in grass that is found on uh, like basically estuaries and they have to complete their entire nesting cycle exactly within one month of the last spring tide. So the biggest, highest high tide in a, have, comes about once in a month, right? Uh, and so the females will start building the nest, lay eggs, raise the chicks and fledge them before the next highest high tide or spring tide comes, which completely submerges the nest. So uh, environmental pressure also drives how, uh, how quickly the eggs develop, the chicks develop and fledge the nest. Okay, so uh, moving on. So next, next phase is fledglings. And uh, so these birds are basically out of the nest, but not independent. And fledgling stage really, really varies again, because uh, it totally depends on uh, whether some birds are fledglings at birth, right? So can someone tell me which birds might be fledglings at birth? So fledglings are dependent on their parent, but not, not in the nest. Can someone tell me which birds can be fledglings at birth? Sorry? Fowl? Fowl, Jungle yeah. fowl? Jungle fowl, absolutely. And even the ratites like ostriches, emus and all those. Yeah, all ducks also, ducks. right? Yeah, Turkeys ducks also are... for that matter. Exactly. So a lot of birds are fledglings at birth, uh, but the length of the fledgling state. So, uh, how long the parents feed the chicks after they are done, after they hop out of the nest, uh, also varies by size of the bird. So albatrosses and penguins have huge fledgling stages. They have like months and months and months. Um, by what food they eat. So many birds that are very specialized in, uh, in the food they eat actually have uh, longer uh, fledgling stages. So for example, a lot of raptors who have to learn how to hunt and kill uh, have really long fledgling stages or juvenile stages where the parents are still feeding them, uh, whether they're migratory or not. So actually, whether the bird migrates or not puts a big pressure on the fledgling to get become independent, right? Uh, so a lot of migratory birds have a very have a relatively smaller fledgling stage. Migratory raptors, for example, um, and 
but, but again, fledging stages may also vary by more proximate or more immediate environmental or ecological pressures like mold cycles or predation or other stuff. So we've talked a little about the different stages of the uh, nesting and breeding cycle of birds. We, we talked about which birds lay, which birds have nests, don't have nests, how many parents take care of the young, how many eggs, little about incubation, about the nestling and breeding cycles. Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention about the nestling and fledging cycles is, is that a lot of birds uh, grow tremendously outside. Uh, like once they hatch out, the they grow tremendously and there's a lot of really cool physiology involved. Uh, imagine if uh, you were born the size that you were born, but you, you were uh, the size of your parents in, you know, a couple of weeks. Imagine the amount of growth you need to do to uh, get to that. And birds do that all the time, right? So there's, they put on m like many times their weight. So the, a typical uh, like sparrow, house sparrow chick is uh, about, I want to say one or two grams, one gram maybe at birth. And uh, when they fledge uh, at about, I think house sparrows fledge at day 18 or between day 18 and day 21, uh, they are the whatever close to their parents' weight or at least or even more than their parents' weight. So that's house sparrows weigh about 20 grams. So imagine going from one, uh, if so, if, one one gram to 20 grams in a matter of 20 days so they're basically almost doubling their weight for the first couple of days every day and then they, they are uh, growing really rapidly so again that's something that i couldn't didn't even uh, get a chance to talk about in detail but that's again that ontogeny uh, is really really cool the other things uh, that I really wanted to mention actually is that nesting behavior is both conserved and what is called evolutionarily labile. So uh, many nesting traits of many birds are uh, what are called phylogenetically or evolutionarily conserved. And uh, this means that um, there is similarity in the breeding cycle of many birds that belong, that are very closely related to each other. So for example, all woodpeckers lay some kind of cavity nest okay i think there are a couple of woodpeckers that lay uh, or i know a ground woodpecker in south africa uh, lays uh, nests in burrows but most other woodpeckers make cavity nests in trees right uh, all kinds of plovers all lapwings and plovers make nests on the ground uh, they're very or something that is flat so i know some like red especially red water lapwings make uh, nests on people's rooftops but they're also flat uh, so there are many many so you will never find find a sand grouse nest uh, in a tree right so these traits are called what are called evolutionarily conserved traits where a whole family will have very similar nesting ecology uh, or close related birds will have very similar nesting ecology does that make sense evolutionarily conserved yes give me a thumbs up if you if it makes sense Okay, perfect. Uh, um, the other part are called what are called evolutionarily labile traits. And evolutionarily labile traits means that within the same family of birds, there is diversity in nesting ecology. So, uh, and which means that, for example, cavity nesting and open nesting uh, is uh, are two common traits that many birds go back and forth. Uh, and uh, uniparental care and multiparental care and biparental care is also something that is uh, labile. So, in I think in 2015, me and Frank Lassard, uh showed how the how environmental changes or environmental uh, constraints uh, constrain the behavior of this behavior of uniparental female only parental care in frugivores. So, within the same family, birds uh, that live in areas with shorter fruiting uh, season lengths or fruiting seasons have biparental care, while birds that live in areas with long, really long fruiting seasons, uh, they have uniparental care. So, uh, uniparental care and biparental care and multiparental care can evolve at the species level. It's not 
conserved at the genus or family level. So there is independent evolution of these traits happening, depending on the ecology and the environment that the species lives in. A similar example is from another paper that I did, and this is a this is a family that uh, that occurs in India, obviously Mesocapidae, which are old world flycatchers. We actually showed that uh, cavity nesting uh, flycatchers and open nesting flycatchers uh, evolve uh, in like so. Cavity nesting and open nesting have evolved again and again in many different genera within Mucicapids, and uh, we showed that cavity nesting flycatchers that uh, so if you have two species that are sister to each other they're each other's closest relatives one is a cavity nester the other is an open cup nester the cavity nester always has significantly larger clut sizes because they have lower predation pressure than the open cup nesting bird and so um, a lot of these traits that uh, we uh, are really labile and evolve uh, are, are naturally selected for and evolve independently of each other. Uh, the third is that there is tremendous uh, effect of behavior also. So uh, this is again a paper that I published on Acon Woodpeckers where we talked about how habitat saturation, the, uh, the absence of independent breeding opportunities uh, drives some females to uh, form joint nesting coalitions. So they go from a biparental care to multiparental care within their lives. So uh, they they might start off as a multiparental care where they joint have a joint nest with multiple females, but that same individual, when those females, when her sisters and or joint nesters die, uh, she can raise uh, chicks on her own as a as a biparental to male female pair. So. Uh, nesting behavior is both evolutionarily labile, which means that traits can disappear or reappear within the same family, uh, but they in but many traits are also conserved. For example, uh, all birds lay eggs. That's a breeding trait that is conserved across all birds. All birds, uh, many passerine, many passerines uh, are born naked uh, and can't thermoregulate themselves. Uh, that's again another phylogenetically conserved trait, right? So. Some traits are conserved, other traits are labile. Um, from an Indian point of view, this is, is uh, it's studying the nesting biology of birds is really, really important. And uh, so does anyone know what bird this is? No idea, sorry. Some type of a trogon maybe. Yes, yes, that's right, Amrita. Uh, so, that's a ward trogon from uh, Arunachal Pradesh, and it's the highest living trogon uh, in the world, highest like highest elevation living trogon in the world. But the crazy thing about ward trogon is that ward trogons are hundred or maybe thousands of photographers photograph ward trogons in places like Eagle Nest and Sikkim every year. Uh, but we have no idea what their nesting biology is. Nobody has ever seen a ward trogon nest. And uh, there are very sim there are similar animals, uh, similar birds in India. So black-headed uh, black-headed shrike babblers, uh, or marsh babblers. Marsh babblers are something that are found in uh, places like uh, Dhing Patkai and uh, Maguri Beel. And we have no idea what their breeding biology is. So in many ways, with studying breeding biology of Indian birds, we are just this is just the beginning. There's tremendous amount of information that is not known. Uh, and there is, even for common birds, there's a lot that is not studied. So you might, if you look at the, uh, if you look at Ripley and Ali and Ripley, uh, those volumes have a lot of information on species, on, on a lot of species. The basic biology of a bunch of birds is known. We know that shamas all have cavity nests. Uh, even though they are flycatchers, all uh, and their sister species, uh, Oriental magpie robins, also have cavity nests. Uh, but we don't know how much the clut size varies, uh, or where the nest nests are placed. We there is probably really very little information on the fledgling uh, fledging success, or the fledgling period, or how long the incubation period is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So even for a lot of common birds, uh, we might know some basics, but there's still a lot to be studied. Uh, I want to finally end by saying, telling something that, uh, that I, I told Rahul already, but uh, we are in uh, the process of 
publishing a paper that sort of outlines this problem where uh, we say that it is really important to study the nesting birds, uh, especially in India. Uh, but you have to really take care that uh, all, that you follow uh, really good sound uh, research methods and research ethics also. And we outline some of those resources uh, that will uh, guide you to uh, help you make good choices about what research methods to follow and how, what uh, research ethics are and where you can access information on what are good research ethics when you're studying the uh, nesting biology of birds. Uh, so I want to close with that and I want to uh, invite you to go out and uh, observe some birds. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a few questions? Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. Uh, you told uh, in the beginning of the lecture that in eagles, uh, the biological parents may be different and the direct parents who nurture the chicks are different. So what is mm -hmm. the, and, uh, but this was, uh, this is opposite of what I heard. I had heard that uh, eagles and vultures have fixed partners. That means they don't uh, change partners for life, so, pair for life. That's a good question. Uh, there is, uh, so I had not shown a photo of eagles, but I didn't, uh, first of all, I didn't really mean, I mean, eagles per se, but in many, many birds, there is what is called extra pair copulation, okay. uh, which means that both males and females copulate with their, their not their social partner oh. uh, and so the amount and this is widespread across animals right like everything and humans are no exception mm -hmm. uh, there is always extra pair copulations and uh, there is the the amount of uh, the prevalence of this varies widely. So some birds, there is very, very little extra pair copulation. Uh, in other birds, there is very high extra pair copulation. So there are some studies that show that in house wrens, uh, which is uh, which is actually Troglodytes adon now. Uh, so house wrens, which is a bird that's widespread in South America, uh, the, the EPC extra pair uh, young maybe 64 percent of all the youngs of all the young in the nest so if there are 10 chicks in the nest six might not be uh from the from the fifth but uh in the, the florida J uh, is a bird that lives in uh in the sand like the sand hills of florida and, oh, sorry can you repeat uh, the name they have actually z sorry, florida scrub J. Florida scrub jay. Yeah. And Florida scrub jay have zero EPCs known. So there is a long term study of Florida scrub jays and there is no extra pair young ever. Uh, so there is a wide, uh, again, wide range of how many uh, chicks might be from the biological parents, uh, from the social parents. So I would like to ask uh, the sure. que question about uh, why clutch size increases as latitude increases. Oh, that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me about that. So, um, the obviously uh, there are it's the the answer. There's no definitive answer, and it might be different for different uh, animals, or if, I mean different species of birds. But uh, there are a couple of things that are different. Um, A the uh, breeding seasons are much shorter at high latitudes, right? So at really high latitudes, the summers are really short. Uh, and uh, at low latitudes in the tropics, the summers are, are, the breeding seasons are much longer. So for example, in India, sunbirds start nesting in February and they might nest all through October, November. Uh, so they have many nests throughout that period. Uh, while in in the Arctic, birds can only basically nest in mid-May to mid-July, and then it starts getting really cold again. So the uh, breeding season in those two areas are very small. So the birds naturally to pack in as many chicks as they want to produce in one year into one clutch, rather than many small clutches. Does that make sense? So one one popular hypothesis is that just just because the breeding season is really short, they have to lay a large clutch of eggs 
that will ensure that they can produce as many eggs in that one or two chances they get to breed versus a tropical bird that can lay many small clutches uh, and probably lose several to uh, predation, uh, but still will produce a, uh, a bunch of young. The other thing uh, may also be uh, food availability. So uh, the, there is tremendous food availability in the summer in the because uh, there is really, really a huge bout of insects that come out uh, in the short summer because all the insects want to complete their life cycles also. Uh, but there is much less variation in food availability in the tropics. So many temperate living birds actually take advantage of this abundance of food and which means that they, it might be viable for them to get enough food to feed a bigger clut size. Uh, so in tropical areas, because there's less food available or there's less variation, uh, adults can only forage for themselves and maybe one or two chicks. But in uh, temperate areas or high latitude areas in the Arctic, uh, there might be enough food that the uh, adults can forage for, you know, seven or eight chicks. From so this are... one question uh, arised in my mind that mm -hmm. due to climate change and more uh, colder and temperate areas becoming warmer. Mm -hmm. So will there be changes in the breeding behavior of the birds as well as breeding uh, seasons? That means will they get extended breeding season? Yeah, like, that's uh, a great question. Siddhartha has a similar question. It mm -hmm. says, does climate affect the incubation period of so like if climate change affects the incubation periods of the egg and the growth of the young ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, those are both really great questions. So uh, the verdict is still out because climate, we, we don't have many really long term studies of uh, birds after we realized, you know, it's only been 10 or 15 years that we have really been talking about climate change seriously. But at the same time, yes, climate change is affecting the breeding biology of birds, most importantly, because uh, the birds often use uh, day photo period cues uh, as uh, uh, cues to start migrating. So they, they start migrating uh, or start breeding uh, after some, a, like when the photo period or the length of the day gets to some level, okay? Um, but what is happening is because the because areas uh, that are warming, the insects are coming out much earlier than they used to. So when a warbler that breeds in South America flies all the way to the Canadian Arctic to breed or the Canadian boreal forest to breed, the peak in the insect activity has already happened. And in the good old days, uh, before climate change happened, uh, the birds were synced with the insect availability. So they got back to the nesting, nesting places just as the insects were peaking. So most birds want to uh, nest in a way where they, where they time their nestling period. So not the incubation and egg laying period, their nestling period with when food availability will be highest. Okay. So because their two parents are potentially feeding like six other birds that are doubling their weight every day. Right. So they, they need a lot of food. Um, and what is happening is there's a mismatch in when the food availability peaks and when the eggs hatch out of the nests now, because the parents that are back in South America or that are or the green greenish warblers or the blight reed warblers that are down in South India don't know that the insect availability is already peaking in Eurasia where they breed in Siberia where they breed. So by the time they get there, uh, the the insect activity is already peaked, which means that they can they can fledge or they can successfully raise fewer offspring every year. So uh, they may lay big clutches, but they don't successfully hatch as many chicks as they used to 100 years ago. And so that is that is a known uh, change in the breeding behavior. Uh, the as opposed to that incubation periods, I really don't know. Those things are. Uh, I don't know if incubation periods have been affected by, by the temperature per se, uh, largely because 
the eggs have to be incubated at the temporal body temperature of the bird, which is 40 degrees Celsius. And it's very, very difficult to find any place that has that is 40 degrees Celsius. So they're often completely at the at the uh, female or male's mercy to keep them at that temperature anyways. So I don't think incubation period has been affected to a great extent. Uh, but the number of chicks that are successfully fledged are definitely affected. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. You talked about multi-parenting and bi-parenting. So do they increase their own fitness uh, by raising their siblings? Yeah, absolutely. So it's called inclusive fitness theory. Uh, and it's a it's a broader uh, it fits within the broader thing kin selection where uh, yes if you are going to uh, have a joint nest then it is much better to have a joint nest of your uh, with your uh, sister or your sibling or or mother or your father so someone who you are highly like very close related to so that uh, when your uh, sister raises her sibling or when your brother raises a sibling. Uh, you are still 0.25 related. You are you are related to your nephew and niece. So instead of raising some in evolutionary terms, again, uh, you increase your fitness by raising a chick that is closely closely related to you. Um, and so yes, there is inclusive fitness benefits to having, but it is not. It is considered not the same as having your own chicks. So it is a it's a trade off. It's a compromise. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Um, mm -hmm. Sure. Like in the earlier slides, you mentioned about brood parasitism, where there was, I think, a wobbler and a cuckoo. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the chick kind of grew, outgrows the parent, and it can be really exhausting for the parent as well to keep feeding it. So, mm -hmm. are there any such studies or somewhere where the uh, parents have evolved to realize that they are getting brood parasites, getting brood parasites in their nest, and uh, something of that sort to save their own uh, life in a way. Absolutely. So there's, uh, there is, a, it's an arms race. Okay. So every, uh, every there is, there's again, there's been multiple. Uh, independent evolutions of brood parasitism across the across the bird world so cuckoos and warblers are just one kind there are cowbirds in uh, in cow in the new world there are anis in uh, the new world also there are estrelid finches indigo birds that are called indigo birds in africa they're all uh, nesting so each so let's take a step back every cuckoo every bird female bird that lays laying eggs knows exactly how many eggs she has laid. So when a cuckoo, is, uh, let's talk about the cuckoo system first. When the cuckoo lays an egg, she takes out an egg because females can count and they know if they come back and they see one extra egg, they're like, who the hell laid this egg? So uh, they, then they desert the whole clutch because they're like, this is, there's something wrong here. So the female always eats, the cuckoo always eats one egg uh, of the, thing she's parasitizing so that's that's one okay so if the if the cuckoo doesn't do that then her her egg also has no chance uh, they also there are lots of really good studies where uh, the females will know the pattern on the eggs that they have laid so any any egg that is slightly smaller slightly larger slight very different pattern different color they reject it so they they'll kick out that egg so the, it's an arms race constantly. The cuckoos are evolving ways to mask their eggs better. Uh, and, and within cuckoos, so there might be, uh, you might have brain fever birds that live uh, in the monsoon, right? And in, in, in and around Mumbai, uh, common hawk cuckoos. And each female common hawk cuckoo uh, is adapted to lay, to mimic the eggs of only one species. So one common hawk cuckoo can't go from laying an egg in a jungle babbler nest will fly over and lay her eggs in a red, red, red winter bulbul nest because they have to mimic the eggs that they, uh, that they parasitize. So uh, they are each female can only parasitize one species. Uh, finally, the other really cool thing is you should all look up 
Estrelid finches gape designs. So indigo birds are these really cool finches that live in uh, Africa, Central and South Africa. Uh, when they open their mouth, when the chicks open their mouth, they have a very unique pattern of black and white spots inside their mouth. Okay. And those patterns are species specific. There is a lot of interspecies brood parasitism in these birds. So these bird, what, so one species of uh, finch will actually go and lay eggs in another species of finch. And uh, one way of telling whether they are your own species or not is whether the chicks, when they hatch out, have the right markings inside their mouth or not. Um, and I can send you a link for that, uh, for, of a photo of that. Uh, but so many birds have evolved very, lots of different ways to catch uh, brood parasitism. Uh, you just mentioned that the hawk cuckoo female can parasitize perfectly mimic one one egg of a certain species. So does mm -hmm. it differ from female to female, or like all of them can only? Yeah. No, uh, it, it differs from. Well, I actually don't know whether. So I I think there are lineages of females within each population, uh, and there was actually a really cool study that came out recently that the males, because the males mate with all females, all kinds of females, uh, that's why there are uh, not that many different species of the common cuckoo. So the common cuckoo, which lives in Europe, uh, parasitizes many different species of birds, but uh, that variation is only for the females and the males are, uh, can breed with all different species parasitizing females. Uh, and so that's why they're all one species. But I don't know. I'm guessing there is some uh, inheritable or heritable trait where the if the mother uh, parasitizes uh, reed warblers and the daughter probably also parasitizes reed warblers. But uh, there are subpopulations of females within a population of cuckoos that are specialized for each species. Uh, I have one question. Mm -hmm. uh, in in case of some birds, uh, the males or or either the male or the female are seen more frequently. Like in purple drum sunbird, a mm -hmm. uh, female is seen most frequently. I, I don't remember seeing a male purple drum sunbird. Mm -hmm. And in cuckoos, male is seen very commonly and not the female. In mm -hmm. Asian quail, I mean. Right. So what's the reason behind it? Uh, it's only detection. It's just that. You, you just you just you just hear the coil male coil male coil more than the uh, female coil and there there is no evidence to suggest that any bird uh, lives in or does not have a 50 50 sex ratio okay. so if there is one co one male coil there's definitely a female coil there and if there is a purple drum sunbird there's probably a female purple drum sunbird obviously at the at the population level, the uh, there might be differences, uh, but that's true for all uh, populations of all animals, right? Including humans. Uh, Kerala has a much more uh, equal sex ratio than Haryana, and so uh, there may be some some exceptions and some variation within that. But most birds have a 50-50 uh, sex ratio. But the nestling, so go, going back to answer your question, the who takes care of the young might vary. So female sunbirds might be more uh, attentive towards chicks than male sunbirds. And that may have evolved because male sunbirds are much more brightly colored and much more attract probably more predators easily. So they feed less than females. That's a hypothesis. I don't know if that's been tested. So I have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any specific number like uh, you said the cuckoo lay eggs in another uh, nest mm -hmm. so is, is there any specific number uh, of how many eggs she lays yeah the, so yeah the most cuckoo lays. yeah so the most cuckoos lay only one egg per nest but they go from nest to nest and lay i don't know how many actually i don't know how many eggs cuckoos lay but they can lay many many eggs because uh, that's their whole um investment in breeding so they probably 
have a pretty big clutch size, but they do it one at a time. So, and she produces only one egg every day. So she has to find one new nest every day. Uh, thank you, sir, so much uh, for the very interesting oh, yeah, talk. <laughs> Uh, I'm yeah, we had lots of questions and thank you for uh, answering them. And yeah, uh, of course, my pleasure. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Sahas, sir. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, uh, no, you don't have to say, call, call me Sahas, sir. You can call me Sahas. Okay, cool. Sahas. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, all the best. And tell me, like, you can always email me questions. And uh, if any of the course participants have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them also. Just email me questions. <laughs>